collection of books, the, 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 the library that Robert had, uh, and I, I said to him, have you ever been drawn in by religion? Have you ever believed in any one of these metaphysical systems, any one of these religions? He said no. And then he pointed to a, a section of well-thumbed books, mainly by Idris Shah, the way of the Sufis and said, but they nearly got me. He said they nearly got me. And he said it with a kind of good-natured pride, like a man who'd escaped a shark attack and could dine out on the story. They nearly got me. The Sufis nearly got me. Because many of the stories, the teaching stories, are beautiful. Yeah, there's a profound relationship between truth, beauty, and goodness in the Western tradition. We would like to think that these things go together. This is Plato's inheritance. Uh, that truth, beauty, and goodness go together. It may be the case that some things are just very, very beautiful, but not at all true. But they're so beautiful they deserve to be true. And in some ways, that's the spirit in which I want to approach the relationship between aesthetics and truth in things like Kabbalah, which are systematic. Kabbalah is a system. Whether it's a useful system or not is a different question. <coughs> so, <coughs> I do have pages of, uh, I'm not entirely winging it, I have uh, about 15 pages of notes which I could go through, but uh, I think in a small intimate session like this, it's, it's better to do something conversational rather than something professorial. So we'll start with the title. Robert Lenkowitz and Pythagoras, the biggie. Symbolism, Magic and Kabbalah. I'd like to start perhaps with um, a slight aside, with, uh, owing a bit of a debt to Bergson here, the philosopher Henry Bergson. Let's get over the word magic. Let, let's put the word magic aside. Let's not just see it as something that's like illusion or delusion or something necessarily supernatural. Um, let, let, let's use the word magic and let's not, just, let, let, let's not feel uncomfortable about it. Yeah? Let, let's see magic as something like, something very old fashioned, perhaps even pre Christian, the work of the mage. The mage is just a very wise person who knows how to do certain things. And some of these things are occult in the sense that they are hidden. But they're not occult in the sense that they are necessarily spooky dooky. <laughs> these forces work. Mind control, for example, is real. Mind control is absolutely real. There's no doubt about it. If it wasn't, <coughs> why do you think there are companies like Nike and Coca-Cola who are not spending millions, billions every week, making sure that when you think of a fizzy drink, you think of their fizzy drink. When you think of a, a, a type of sports footwear, you think of their type of sports footwear. This is absolutely real. If it wasn't real, they wouldn't be plowing that amount of money into it. Yeah? There are forces at work here which are not particularly demonic, I don't think, but um, do not have your best interests at heart, let's put it that way. Mm. Let me start with anybody who had the most glancing acquaintance with Robert, his work, his murals, his paintings, his projects, knows that he was fascinated with signs, symbols, secret signs, coding systems. Um, this is a page from his notes from the mid-70s, um, which you can't quite see from there. It's a, it's a fairly typical page of notes. Um, I think in some ways Robert was not a believer in God or gods, but he was looking for evidence, almost like he wanted to find a fingerprint at the crime. If life was a crime, he wanted to find a fingerprint at the crime scene. And he found partial prints, he found hints. He wasn't a closed-minded atheist who just thinks that God has been dismissed the way Fergus at the bottom of the garden has been dismissed. He didn't want to be a boring atheist, I don't think. He wanted to stay open to the fact that, you know, the strangest thing, communication with an outside of the human may well be possible. Whether that be through some sort of spiritualism, you know, the fox sisters and the table knocking, aliens, UFOs, um, borderline, liminal experiences, um, ritual and ceremonial magic. Characters like Gurdjieff, Ospensky, Crowley, who was fascinated with these people. Were they in touch? Were they tapping into something extra human? Were they tapping into something out with human experience? I think Ruben said to me this afternoon when we were chatting, Robert thought no, but they thought they did. Their experiences were not entirely hallucinatory. Something was going on there, and Robert was very interested in what was going on there. And rather than just jumping to, and the answer is it's God, or the answer is it's aliens, or the answer is it's angels. You know, 
don't destroy the phenomena. The phenomena of people speaking in spirit voices is a real phenomena. Don't just deny that it's, don't just pathologize it. Yeah? Let's look at this and ask what's going on here. <coughs> so, secret code, secret writings. These are his notes on, I believe this is from the late 1970s, possibly 1979 when this was first heard. It was a program um, called Chronicles, The Shadow of the Templars. And um, it was the, the beginning of the Prior de Zion, Holy Blood, Holy Grail <coughs> uh, shenanigans, let's call it. Yeah. It's not entirely fraud. Much of it based on fact. A lot of the facts are stretched and interpreted in odd ways. Uh, but there are strange little truths going on in there. Just some of these notes which you can't quite read at distance, I'm afraid. But uh, April 1656, Poussin had a secret. The famous painting of the, the uh, shepherds of Arcadia pointing to the tomb. It's been interpreted over, interpreted over, interpreted. We'll come back to that later. 